next speaker is uh, uh, Bruno Borghe from the University of Buenos Aires, um, who will be talking about fundamentality and non-symmetric dependence. Sorry for uh, running a bit out of time here uh, due to technical di uh, difficulties. Uh, so we will just let uh, go five minutes into the coffee break. I, I, I'll try to make it in 25 minutes so we yeah. not lose. Well, I, I have a longer discussion. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I won't say sorry for my English. I should. But <laughs> I will say that you can interrupt me at any time if you want me to clarify or rephrase. Yeah, we, we work in Argentina mainly in Spanish, so English is not usually my thing. Well, this, this presentation deals with fundamentality and, and uh, ontological dependence, and I'll try to show a way in which a non-symmetric notion of ontological dependence can be think to be compatible with the standard picture of uh, reality as a layered uh, distribution of levels of ontological dependence. So this talk m maybe runs the way uh, between science and metaphysics all the way around. It starts with metaphysics and goes to science, but still I think it would be interesting, or I hope it to be interesting, uh, pointing out some interesting facts about fundamentality both in metaphysics and in science. So I, I will start talking about what it is usually called the layered conception of reality. Um, the, this layered conception of reality uh, depends, well, depends might not be the word, it's related, closely related to a notion of ontological independence that uh, establish a strict partial order between ontological levels. So in order to that to happen, we need uh, our notion of ontological dependence to be um, uh, um, anti-symmetrical. So then I will try to present some problems, issues, worries about what happens <coughs> if we drop the anti-symmetry as a logical property of our notion of ontological dependence. I will review an argument by Rabin that says that we can have a notion of ontological dependence that is non-symmetric and at the same time preserve the so-called layered conception of reality. I will criticize some aspects of this argument and I hopefully sh uh, show a new route to what I call weak compatibility trying to put forward a novel notion of ontological dependence that restores some kind of non-symmetricity. So, so let's, let's start with this layered conception of reality, this, this cake-like conception of reality as constituted by ontological levels. The, 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 usual, the usual way of, of, of the orthodox way of conceiving reality in, in this wave involves many theses. The, the, the main ones are now on, on the slide. I will concentrate here in, in the first one, which is the idea that there is a hierarchy of layers of levels that is uh, structured by a relation of ontological dependence that give rise to a strict partial order. And in order to that to happen, we need our notion of ontological dependence to be reflexible, transitive, and anti-symmetric. Conceived this way, uh, ontological dependence is closely related with fundamentality. In, in fact, we are used to define <coughs> what it is to be a fundamental entity as being independent of any other entity. Uh, but at is, at it usually happens that the, the three formal properties of ontological dependence has been uh, questioned in recent literature, and I will do the same here, trying to defend a non-symmetrical notion of ontological dependence. But first, why ontological dependence should remain anti-symmetric? There are no many positive arguments for the anti-symmetricity of ontological dependence. M mainly, what is maybe closer to an argument are intuitions that 
ontological dependence should be anti-symmetrical. And some paradigmatic cases in which we find instances of ontological dependence that are clearly uh, anti-symmetric. But the, the main, let's say, argument for the anti-symmetricity of ontological dependence is it's, it's more a negative argument. And it points out the fact that if we abandon a notion, of, if we replace um, anti-symmetricity by a different formal property, the whole idea of the layered conception of reality just fall apart. We need uh, anti-symmetry in order to the whole hierarchical picture remain. Of course, there is many ways in which, in which we, we can abandon uh, anti-symmetricity. Uh, of course, we can go for a symmetric notion of ontological dependence, which um, makes the whole layer conception collapses in one flat level of mutually dependent entities. So that it's metaphysical coherentism, some sort of Buddhist ontology in which everything is placed at the same ontological level and happens mm -hmm. to depend upon everything else. But the usual way to go in this matter is to replace an anti-symmetrical notion of ontological dependence by a non-symmetrical notion of ontological dependence. That is a notion of ontological dependence that admits both symmetric and non-symmetric instances of dependence. Of course, there are many ways uh, to do that. I will skip mainly the technical details, but at the end of the day, what it um, gives raise is to loops of dependence. Loops of dependence are not harmful by themselves. In fact, if we are willing to admit uh, symmetric instances of dependences, you are admitting loops. Because if A depends upon B and B depends upon A, you have a loop. What, what is worrying about loops of dependence and I will try to show you that um, uh, later on, is that whenever you have loops of dependence, we have isolated niches of <laughs> metaphysical coherentism. We have not sorry, the whole sorry. building. Sorry, isolated what, sorry? Uh, isolated um, um, niches, I, uh, isolated, uh, thank you. Um, sex stores of the building that collapse into one flat level of mutually uh, dependent entities. I, I, I will give an example and a clarification later, later so, so this point can, can you raise it um, in a few minutes. So, so loops of dependence are um, harmful because of that reason that I will show you in, in a few minutes. So moral of the story, dependence should remain anti-symmetric. So there are two like, standard answers to this, to this fact. The first is what I call divorce. Well, if uh, we need necessarily a notion of ontological dependence that is anti-symmetric in order to um, defend the layered conception of reality, so we should separate the talk of uh, fundamentality from the talk of ontological dependence and find a different kind of relation, call it building relation, grounding, whatever notion you prefer in order to articulate our talk about fundamentality. But ontological dependence and uh, fundamentality should be not <coughs> share any room. And that's mainly the idea behind Elizabeth Barnes' answer to this, to this topic. Uh, but the answer I'm interested in is one from Rabin, who takes, well, ground to be a subspecies of ontological dependence that is relevant to the talk of fundamentality. And at, at the end of the day, the, the point is on uh, non symmetric ontological dependence and the layer conception of reality are compatible. So let's, let's just take a look at the argument. So what Rabin says is that, yeah, 
in the orthodox talk of fundamentality and this layered conception of reality, we uh, should accept the what he calls the simple principle. And it goes this way. If x grounds y, then x is at a lower level or it's more fundamental than y. Well, we, we should drop that principle, Rabin says, and we should replace it uh, from with what he calls the slightly less simple principle. That is, if x ground y and x does not ground x, then x is more fundamental or a lower level. Well, this, this opens the question on what happens when uh, the instance of the relation actually is symmetric. And that gives you, give us two options, Rabin said. The first one is to think that they share the same level in our ontology. The second option is to think that they are incommensurable. So he, he takes the first one for, for many reasons. One has to do with, with uh, the preserve the transitivity of dependence and he thinks that uh, incommensurability on this matter are it's, it's not desirable at the in the first place. So so whenever we have symmetric instance of instances of ontological dependence, both relata should be placed at the same ontological level. Well, I have many objections to this idea. I will just mention three that I will present as two. The, the first one is that this slightly less simple principle, let's just call it LS, SLSP principle, generates some counterintuitive cases of mutually dependent entities that we don't think should be placed at the same level in our picture of ontology. And the second one is what um, I mentioned early, and I will try to, to explain it a little bit more, is that we have loops of dependence and that gives rise to restricted holism and also a weak form of incommensurability. So, so let's start with, with this. I, I will pass these examples quickly because I will back to some of them later. Um, these are paradigmatic cases that motivates uh, the development of non-symmetric notions of ontological dependence. Um, so just for taking one, let's, let, let's, <coughs> let's take the, the relationship between facts and constituents, being fact a fundamental category of reality. If facts and constituents are mutually dependent entities, as some uh, think they are, uh, and they depend symmetrically on each other, facts and its constituents should be placed at the same level of a hierarchy of an um, ontology. So that that's, doesn't seem to be intuitive since we uh, want facts to be more fundamental, such as substance or whatever, than its constituents. So the other problem is holism. So if dependence is thought to be non-symmetric and we preserve the other formal properties, what we have is a preorder. And whenever you have a preorder by transitivity, that is a formal property that we want to preserve, what we have is that every element in um, the, in the subset of elements that instance um, symmetric instances of ontological dependence depends on each other, so we have a flat level of entities. So, so let me let me give a, a, a quick example. We have this simple domain of six elements, so we divide it into subdomains. The first one, ABC, are structured by a traditional um, asymmetric instances of ontological dependence, and the other subdomain, B, E, F, and D, are uh, structured by uh, symmetric instances of ontological dependence. So in the what we have is that in the second subdomain, the one that relates D, E, and F, everything depends upon everything 
in one flat level. And, and this is not only an undesirable consequence for the so-called layered uh, conception of reality, but also it implies a form of incommensurability. If we try to relate one specific element of any of the subset with the other, that new element uh, collapses into this flat level of metaphysical coherentism. So what we have now is um, uh, subsets in which metaphysical coherentism uh, obtains and that happens to be incommensurable regarding ontological level with the other parts of the set. So, so my own solution is to put forward a novel notion of ontological dependence that uh, not having a better name, I will call dependence stuck. And the intuition... Should think of a better name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But please, I, 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 can, I can receive <laughs> options. Like, let, let's make it a contest. <laughs> <laughs> so, dependence stars, sorry again, uh, <laughs> it's built upon the intuition that we should distinguish two type of dependence relations, of ontological dependence relation. One is dependence regarding existence and the other one is repair de dependence regarding identity. So whenever X depends star <laughs> upon Y, that means that X depends upon Y for its existence, but at the same time, Y depends upon X for its identity. So let, let, that, that's the intuition. Let's put some flesh in, in those bones. What could mean that something depends for its existence upon something else? Well, the traditional way to go is what is usually called modal existential analysis of ontological dependence. There are many ways to, to, to put this forward, but the, the, the main idea is that definition of rigid and existential dependence. But the, I will pass this very quickly because, as we maybe might, might, might be aware, um, this analysis of ontological dependence is not sensitive so, um, to some specific cases. The, the, maybe the, the more, the more uh, famous ones are the ones um, uh, described by Kit Fine. So, so let's, let's say we have Socrates, I mean the philosopher, the guy, the human being, and the set, the singleton, who, you know, that has at its only element Socrates. The first one is a human, the second one is an abstract entity, and of course they depend on each other in, in, in some way. But if we limit our analysis to the modal existential analysis, we have that they exist in all of the same possible worlds, so they should be taken to depend metaphysically, existentially on each other. But that's not intuitive. At, at the end of the day, we tend to believe that the set exists because Socrates exists, or in virtue of the existence of, of Socrates. So we have to move to an hyper-intentional framework in that can capture that more fine-grained uh, relations of, of ontological dependence, and that framework fine sets it's the essentialist approach to dependence. And in this uh, essentialist approach to dependence, we can identify two subspecies of essential dependence, essential existential dependence and identity dependence, which are the two notions of ontological dependence that we are going to take in order to fill the gaps in our original definition of the uh, beautiful named of dependence star. So what we have now is that X depends star upon Y uh, if X depends um, essentially, existentially upon Y, and Y depends upon X for its identity, just in the sense I uh, illustrated in those definitions here. So, so 
what we have is not exactly a symmetric or non-symmetric notion of dependence, but a definition that glued together two subspecies of ontological dependence in this essentialist view. So, my first point here will be that this opens a uh, route to what I called uh, a weak version of compatibility. I mean, a weak version of the compatibility between a non-symmetric notion of ontological dependence on the one hand and the layered conception of reality on the other hand. So we need some very simple assumptions about both identity dependent, uh, dependence and existential dependence in order to not make the whole building of ontological dependence collapse in one flat level and not having any instances of incommensurability among ontological levels. So that is, that is warrant. Of course, the, the obvious immediate worry with this view is this objection that I call the, well, there is no symmetry in the first place. Dependence start is not a non-symmetric notion of ontological dependence, but just a tailor-made notion of ontological dependence that simply glues together two independent notions of ontological dependence in one theoretical construct. So I, I, I don't have a, a conclusive answer to that obje objection, but I, I, I try to put forward some points that I think that could be interesting, not only by for, for defending my view, but also for pointing out some issues regarding how do we think about fundamentality both in science and in metaphysics. Okay, first one, they are of course distinct, I cannot deny it. Uh, identity dependence and essential existential dependence are distinct dependence relations, but they are not totally independent. First, they are species of the same essential dependence relations, and second, they are always co-instantiated. It doesn't matter in, in, in which direction they run, they are always, whenever we have an instance of one of them, we have an instance of the other relations. And, and maybe more interesting, they seem to be part of the same phenomenon that we can find whenever we think of fundamentality both in science and in metaphysics. So, in order to show what I'm referring, I will just take a few examples. The first one, I, I, I thought, I talked, sorry, uh, 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 about it uh, before, it's from the debate on what is the fundamental category of reality. Um, in that debate, one of the main uh, contenders is factualism. So we should regard facts as being the central fundamental category of reality. So, so if that's true, we should say what a fact is, and the usual answer uh, from factualists is that the fact is uh, had two complementary categories, that is the fact itself and its constituents. So facts and constituents are uh, in a special relation that is the constituent or constituency relationship. So of course, as we are talking about which is the more fundamental category of reality, facts are thought to be more fundamental than its constituents, but at the same time, for a fact to be the fact that it is, it is essential that it has those constituents and not different ones. So let me just um, give the, ah, oh, well, the example was, was, was in this slide. Sorry, so see, if I say this type, the table is brown, that's a fact, and its constituents are the table and the brown, let's say. So, the fact is more fundamental than the table and, and the brown, but still, for being the fact that the table is brown, they need to have those constituents and not 
different ones. So there is more or less the intuition that the fact itself is more fundamental or gives existence to the constituents, but the identity of the fact itself dep depends upon its constituents. So I think this uh, dependence star relation that I just tried to put forward fits well with this example in the debate of on the basic ontological categories and well this is the case with the table and thank you more or less the same can be uh, said about the relationship between sus substance and accidents in a different frame the framework the substantialist framework of course, it doesn't mean that always um, existing dependence and identity dependence should ru run in different directions. In many examples, the majority of them, they run in the same direction, and this is what happened in the relationship between Socrates and Singleton Socrates. Identity and existential, essential existential dependence run in the same direction. But just in the last minutes, I will skip more of the, 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 the technical details. Uh, <coughs> I want to try to mention symmetries and specifically some discussions in the ontology of symmetries uh, having more or less the same features that I try to um, cover with this notion of dependence start. Of course, there's no need to make an ontological in interpretation of what symmetries are. We are not uh, obligated to include symmetries in our ontology, but for some people, the fact that symmetries have a um, determining role over particles on um, fundamental properties, it's a sign that we should include symmetries in our ontology. And we can, of course, do it in, in, in many ways. The, the example I, I try to show in the screen, I will try to, to simplify, just maybe read the bottom line, the point. Um, for philosophers shows such as Stephen French, the fact that symmetries play a determining role over the identification of the kinds of fundamental properties that they are, it's a reason to build, well, specifically in, in his case, an ontology in which symmetries are thought to be the fundamental category of reality and the fundamental entity of reality. They, he uh, actually articulates his eliminated form of ontic structural realism upon this assumption. Something not very far from it is the, the, the way in which we can identify fundamental properties only uh, based on symmetry uh, procedure. I will just skip this and, well, something in, 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 in its vein can be said about the relationship between um, conservation laws and um, conserve quantities uh, in the application of neither theorem. I will just skip this. But the, the philosophical point of, of those cases, at least of people <coughs> defending and ontological interpretations of symmetries in, in this case, can be maybe summed up in this quote by Silos that, that you have on screen. The fundamental properties of elementary particles seem to be determined by powerful global and local symmetries that exist in nature. So we started with the view that properties of elementary particles are unrounded because they are fundamental, but in the end they are or probably are grounded in symmetries. So of course there is a lot to say about symmetries and the ontology of symmetries. We have, a, 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 I'm pretty sure, a very interesting and illuminating talk by Christian tomorrow. Uh, not in this vein. No, no, it's of course, <laughs> the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I just just want to put forward the idea that this notion, star notion of ontological dependence, can fit the idea that maybe fundamental particles properties uh, depend for its existence 
for its uh, identity upon symmetries, while symmetries themselves depend from its existence for um, fundamental properties. And, and maybe the debates between this positionalist and um, symmetry realist can be clarified in some sense by this notion. So just for, for finishing the presentation, I try to define this uh, dependence star relationship by combining two species of essential dependence that are coinstantiated, that seems to be part of the same phenomenon, and they are mainly necessarily related. Oh, the bomb, my god. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I think, and I try to show that this opens a way for what I call weak compatibility between the layer conception and a non-symmetric notion of ontological dependence, but still, if we think that that's not a truly non-symmetric notion of ontological dependence, maybe this dependence star can still capture some interesting and also regular features about what, what we think of um, the relationship between fundamentalia and dependence both in science and metaphysics. Thank you. Yeah. So, in, 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 in this example for, let's take this case, we have a loop of dependence in the sense that uh, E depends upon F, F depends upon D, but D also depends upon E. So it's mm -hmm. like a circle. Yeah, yeah. By by transitivity, but by transitivity, what we should have is that everything depends on everything. Whenever you have a, a circle, a loop of dependence between n entities, all those entities depend on every other entity. And that gives you, if you accept, accept that whenever you have symmetry, you should put all those entities in the same level that... And you do we need to keep transitivity wide? Sorry? Why do, we keep, why do you have to conserve transitivity? Well, we, 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 we can, you can uh, uh, drop transitivity too, but it seems to be essential to the very idea of a layered cake-like conception of reality that if um, this is at a lower level uh, than this and this is at a lower level than, well, I don't have yeah, I understand, a but third hand, but, but at this, this is at a lower level than, okay. Yeah, but isn't this the, the whole point of like this kind of metaphysical holism is to drop the foundationalist assumption in the first place. So why should we keep the foundationalist? So this, sorry, uh, I, I think, isn't the whole point of, um, like loops of dependence or metaphysical uh, holism, as Ross Cameron uh, calls them. Isn't this? Isn't the idea is to drop the layered version of reality? But, so yeah, but but so so if we so if you go so if you go through like if we go for loops of dependence as a good way to constitute uh, to um, describe the metaphysics of reality, then we we wouldn't want to keep the layered. Uh, version of reality at, at, the, at the end, and we want to get rid of also that. Well, the, the, the whole uh, this, there is a proviso in the whole talk that, that you you want to conserve ah, okay. the layer conception. The so 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 Why so right? the the main idea is this type of answer is possible okay. that you can make this higher hierarchy hierarchically order mm -hmm. uh, layers of uh, ontological levels and still have a notion of ontological dependence that is non-symmetric that is you, you have standard traditional cases in which there is symmetry but also some specific okay. cases in which in which, okay. uh, in which ontological dependence behave symmetrically in and these are 
the usual candidates for, for those, not, not only the only ones, but the usual candidates for, for symmetrical dependence. Hey, Bruno. Ah, sorry. <laughs> no worries. So I had a, a, a couple of observations. Uh, the first is really just piggybacking on the, the last comment, because I had a similar reaction. But I was going to put it in terms of just wondering, uh, you know, why it is, or you know, the, the layer cake conception of reality um, has purchase on us at all. And I wanted to frame it in terms of your introductory remark that instead of going from science to metaphysics, we're going to go from metaphysics to science. But if we take this a priori metaphysical conception of the world as uh, exhibiting this hierarchical layered structure, right, and then we take it to science, I think, I mean, one argument that I think many people have made is that, well, what we find when we go to science is that there are lots of relations of dependence of different kinds that we can specify. And it seems to provide us, arguably, with counter evidence for the layer cake picture. So there's, you know, I think a substantive question as to whether once we've gone from metaphysics to science in this case, we really have any you know, strong rationale for holding on to that picture. Um, so that was just one observation. I wanted to know whether you thought we do once we start to look at the scientific cases carefully, because in those cases, we have very specific relations that may just make the layer cake model uh, not particularly attractive. But then, you know, the more specific observation had to do with the symmetries. And now that I know that there's going to be a talk on this tomorrow, I, I won't say much about it, except to say that, um, you know, there are a lot of assumptions built in, right, to your example in that particular case. You know, that there are such things, symmetries in the world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that they have, that the relevant relations are things like, um, you know, uh, something having a determining role, right? That's a very poorly specified uh, relation. I mean, what does that mean? Uh, that, you know, particles drop out of the same, what does that mean, right? So, I mean, some relations of dependence we can understand fairly well intuitively, causal relations, some relations of supervenience, and so on and so forth. But dropping out and governing seem really loosey-goosey to me. So that's you know one comment that makes me think that it seems as though half of the debate is represented in the examples you gave. Um, and just a very kind of technical point on that, you suggested that uh, you know for the people to whom you're appealing there, uh, the relations may uh, between symmetries and the properties, uh, the dependencies may go in opposite directions depending on whether we're talking about existence or. But it seems to me that, at least for some of these people, like you bolded Stephen French's view, right? He wants the existence and identity dependence relations to go both in the same direction, right? Yeah. The, both the identity and the existence of the properties depend on the, the symmetries, right? So I wasn't sure who you had in mind as the example of the person who thinks that these relations of dependence go in opposite directions. Okay, I will start for the, this last observation, and then maybe I will ask you for help to remind the, the, the first one. So, so, so the, 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 the whole idea of this talk, actually, stems from the discussion, well, not only among them, but some discussions uh, uh, between Stephen French and his people, and this positionalism. He, he says that if we take this layer conception of reality and we tell the this position this story about how um, <coughs> dynamics um, depends on the behavior of dispositional properties and then symmetries blah 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 we just have to reverse engineer all of that and what we have is uh, symmetries and conservation laws being the fundamental and maybe the only entities we have in reality but on the other hand we have people as uh, Alexander Bird saying, well, no, no, the dispositional this story is, is fine. And um, what happened with this determining role of symmetry principles and conservation law laws? Well, mm, we just can hope that symmetries are eliminated from future physics. That that's Alexander Bird, for example. So, so of course, um, this um, notion of dependence start is not um, built in order to accommodate Stephen French positions and neither in order to accommodate Alexander Bird position but a way to try to conciliate both intuitions 
there is a sense in which what we have in nature are properties and there is also a sense in which something of that properties depends upon cer the certain symmetries. Of course, and I think that that takes me back to the second observation, uh, of course, it's not necessary. You can think about symmetries in, in a different way. So this talk, it's, it's meant to be more or less like a toolbox from metaphysics to the metaphysics of science. If you want to uh, develop a ontological reading of symmetries, and if you think that symmetries are items that should be included on one's ontology, and you can, if, if, if you want to preserve some general intuitions, as, as the one I was mentioning before about their role, well, maybe there is a specific notion of ontological dependence that can be at use. And we can discuss about the first one in the coffee break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.